It's time for Herd Mentality, the weekly episode where you control the discussion today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Well, folks, welcome to the end of the bye week. I guess as we transition from the bye week into the Bills playing the Chiefs, and have a lot of great content planned for you this week. We'll start with herd mentality. Then I have some guest conversations that I'm going to have over the next couple of days, and then we're going to focus in on the Kansas City Chiefs. But today is herd mentality, tons of great questions, really kind of peeling back the Sean McDermott conversation, some Joe Brady discussion, off-season, all kinds of good stuff. So let's get into it. First one comes from Patrick, and this question from Patrick is very similar to one sent in by Dave, and Dave really references Sean McDermott's ability to evolve. This is what Patrick says, and I'm going to answer this all together. Patrick says, do you think Sean McDermott is the coach who is going to bring a Super Bowl to Buffalo? Seems like we have most of the pieces in place to make a good run every year over the past four, but always fall short. Part two, what do you think needs to change for that Super Bowl to happen? Of the podcast and the Discord is an absolute blast to be a part of. Thank you so much, Patrick. So right now, the answer is no. We have not seen Sean McDermott lead the Buffalo Bills to a Super Bowl. As far as he's taken, this team is the AFC Championship game where they led 9 to nothing against the Chiefs and then wound up losing by multiple scores. So the answer so far is no. And one thing that I've considered a lot, even before we've been very frustrated with Sean McDermott this year, is whether or not the Bills' shortcomings have been a lack of capacity or circumstantial issues. I'm not sure it's capacity. I think the Bills have had a capable roster, a team that can do it, a team that can win the entire thing. I think circumstances have gotten in their way, and some of those circumstances are because their head coach. Obviously, 13 seconds, 100 million percent Sean McDermott's fault. Failed the football team. What about last year? 27 to 10 loss to the Bengals. Capacity or circumstantial? I think they just got completely outcoached in the game. Outcoached, outexecuted. Well, what about the AFC Championship game? Well, maybe the Bills weren't better than the Chiefs, but that day they could have been, and they certainly didn't do a good enough job of capitalizing on their early two-score lead. And then they collapse, right, against Houston, 16 to nothing, leading late into the third quarter, unravel, right? and. It's almost like all of that sets the scene for where we are today, where they just tend to unravel. They can't close it out. And so I think the Bills have been a capable football team, but I think circumstances have gotten in their way. And a lot of those circumstances are due to due to game management. And that's my biggest concern right now with Sean McDermott is game management, end of games. Can you pull the right levers at the right times to win football games? And I find myself very concerned about Sean McDermott's tendencies and how that's going to prohibit this team from success. My new fear, and maybe it's not new for some of you, but for me, my new fear is that the Bills are going to be back in some of these big moments, AFC Championship game, Super Bowl. And it's going to end in a way that we're going to lose our minds over Sean McDermott blowing it. My biggest fear right now. And we're going to get to these stages again. And Sean McDermott's going to get in the way. My biggest fear is status quo. That's my biggest fear. 
And so I think Sean McDermott simply needs to embrace the growth mindset that he preaches and understand why late in games he keeps failing. Bruce Nolan did an amazing job of talking about this on his most recent episode. So if you go to the Buffalo Rumblings podcast feed last Thursday, the Bruce exclusive, I think the title of the episode is inevitable. Listen to it. And I'm going to have Bruce on this week on Tuesday. And we're going to talk more about that. In addition to some other things, Gabe Davis, Dalton Kincaid, defensive back seven. We're going to have a pretty well-rounded conversation, but I want to ask him some questions about the things he said in that episode. So I'd really encourage you to listen to that. And so, yeah, I have plenty of concerns about Sean McDermott and his ability to get out of the way and let Josh, let Josh Allen win a Super Bowl for this football team. Next one here comes from Michelle. Michelle says, since we are pretty much resigned to the fact that McDermott is going to keep his job, does he turn over staff? Assuming Brady takes over the offense, does he get guys he wants? It's a good question here, and I think this is appropriate because based on the Tim Graham report, I am operating as if Sean McDermott is going to continue as the head coach of this football team, and I'm not going to really invest energy and thought into replacements because I'm totally buying into what Tim Graham has reported. And so I think two things should happen here with the staff. Number one is, as you mentioned, Michelle, keeping Joe Brady. Unless something crazy happens down the stretch. And we have a good Joe Brady question coming up that I can't wait to dive into in just a moment. Unless something catastrophic happens down the stretch, Joe Brady needs to continue as this team's offensive coordinator. I like what I'm seeing. So that's step one. Step two is I think you need to name a defensive coordinator. And if you're interested in seeking outside options, okay, cool. But I'm pretty interested in Bobby Babich or John Butler, who are currently on staff. Everything Bobby Babich turns, uh, touches turns to gold, whether it's been the safeties, whether it's been the linebackers most recently, with what, it, what he got out of Tremaine Evans and Matt Milano last year what he's getting out of Terrell Bernard this year and Tyrell Dotson, young, bright mind. I'd be super interested in that. And, you know, John Butler's a guy we can't overlook who's the passing game coordinator on defense that has been around for a while. And even this past off season, there were a couple of times where Sean McDermott wasn't at a practice or Sean McDermott, gave him some play calling duties in games. And so it almost feels like the more likely candidate is Sean Butler, but I'm not sleeping on Bobby Babbage. I think Sean McDermott should hand over those play calling duties to one of those two guys. And then of course there's inevitable contracts that may expire and they may move on or those coaches might move on. But I think at its core, this, this coaching staff should retain Joe Brady and name a defensive coordinator likely somebody on staff. And I think you probably need to ask yourself some questions about Matthew Smiley and really examine that situation and why there's been a massive special teams regression this year. Danny says, I've noticed many media members have criticized Sean McDermott for his ag aggressive play calling towards the end of games that have resulted in end of game losses. I completely understand the frustration over losing like that. However, if we're going to lose, I'd rather go down swinging with a zero blitz than the garbage shell defense that Leslie Frazier had us in. I don't have an issue with McDermott's play calling, but I do have an issue with the execution of it. I've seen so many six, seven, and eight-man blitzes towards the end of the game where nobody on the defense got through to the quarterback. Why is this? Are players just tired? Well, I think at, at the core of what you're saying here is that you want to go down swinging. I, I don't think it's about that. I don't think it's about going down swinging or going down being passive. I think it's about doing the right things at the right time to win a football game. And there are times where you need to dial it up and send some pressure. There are times where you need to play passive. And I don't think he's threading that needle at all. Why aren't the zero blitzes working? Because you're making it easy on the quarterback. And the quarterbacks know it's coming. They've said it out loud. You're hearing that messaging from other teams that they know these pressure packages are coming late in games. It's a clear tendency and you just make it easy on that quarterback because they know it's coming, they know there's going to be plenty of space, and they just go to a good matchup. You're making it easy on the quarterback. So it's not about going down swinging or going down 
being passive, whatever, like do the right thing at the right time. And of course there's an execution layer to it, but you can, you can get frustrated that you're sending six, seven, eight men and nobody's getting there and, and think that's an execution error. Well, if the offense knows what's coming, it's hard to execute that because they know what's coming. They know how to counter it. They know how to shift the protection. They know how to throw hot, right? This You're just making it easy on the quarterback, and that's my exception to the whole thing. Do the right thing at the right time to win yourself a football game. All right, folks, plenty to get to. Stick with me. But look, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. This time of year can be challenging for some people, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot amid all the stress and change, something to look forward to to make you feel grounded and to give you the tools necessary to manage everything that's going on. It's helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the very best version of yourself. It isn't just for those who have experienced major trauma. So if you've been thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire. That'll get you matched with a licensed therapist. And then you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So vi- find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash on today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash on. We all like to play fantasy football, but there's always that one annoying guy in the league that you just can't stand. He's a guy that you have to beat no matter what. He's always talking about how good his team is, how good his trades are. He brings up analytics. You know the guy I'm talking about. Let's just call him Alec. Every league has an Alec. But you know what else Alec does? Alec brings weak tortilla chips to a tailgate, the kind that snap right in half when you're scooping guacamole and trying to get that last scoop of salsa. For someone who claims to be the master of trades, he still hasn't made the trade for a better tortilla chip. You see, at Zach's Mighty, we believe in two things. No, number one, chips are meant to be sturdy. And two, Alec doesn't know the difference between a strong chip and a wet paper towel. Our chips are cut from whole tortillas the authentic way to give them the strength to lift the heftiest, heftiest dips and are fried to a corny crisp suitable for any dip at any tailgate. So this season, don't be an Alec and choose Zach's Mighty Tortilla Chips available at all Wegmans locations. Be a winner. Eat Zach's Mighty Tortilla Chips. Nikki says, I've been really encouraged by your reaction to Joe Brady's offense these past couple weeks. You always have measured and reasonable takes, and you have seemed legitimately excited, which is so cool to hear. We all remember the hot start Dorsey's offense had last season, but I don't remember you having anywhere near the same level of excitement for him. My question is, what sort of things are you seeing on tape that separates his scheme from Dorsey's that give you that excitement and confidence? Appreciate the question here, Nikki. I like the way you phrase this. Um, some thoughts. Number one, it's it just passes the sniff test. I'll get a little bit more nuanced here as I work through this answer. But number one, it simply passes the sniff test. I like the way Josh Allen has played in the last two games under Joe Brady, and he's done it against two good defenses, one of them being the Jets, a defense that has given him a lot of problems. So I love the sniff test. I love the production. It's the most points and the most yards against the Eagles and the Jets this year in consecutive weeks. I like that. And while it's been productive, while they've scored and they've produced, they've also taken care of the football. This is a big deal. Against the Jets, the Bills turned it over one time in 12 drives, which was the end-of-half interception. Remember, Josh Allen throws up a Hail Mary and it's intercepted. It's hardly a turnover, but we'll just call it a turnover because it is. Against the Eagles, you had one turnover and 14 drives. And so that's two turnovers. In 26 drives, that is a 7.1% turnover percentage on drives, which for the year, if that was what their turnover percentage was, that's second best in the NFL. In reality, including those two games, the Bills' turnover percentage is 15.4%, more than double. And you're talking about two games 
where you had a ton of plays, 156 plays in both games combined. So there's been plenty of opportunities to turn over the football. So it passes the sniff test. They're productive. They score. And they're taking care of the football while doing it. I love all that. And so that's great. But then you watch the tape and you can just see it. You can see a well-coordinated offense. There's options in the passing game. It's well-spaced. The progressions make sense. And it's allowing Josh Allen to play free. It's allowing Josh Allen to execute. And it's it's just, it's good offense. I love the the run game in terms of how their running backs have been used. I love the blended run schemes and how that has happened. I've been very critical of the Bills trying to execute this blended run scheme approach. And it's actually worked the last two weeks with Joe Brady. And so I I see a well-designed, well-coordinated passing game. Same with the running game. The results are there. It just looks and feels very good. And I'm a big expectations person. And I think when you have your expectations in the right place, I think you can come away with good takeaways. And I, I communicated this on the podcast where when the Bills fired Ken Dorsey and promoted Joe Brady, I, I certainly shared a lot of thoughts. But one of them was I'm not sure that there's going to be that much of a tangible difference. I think the biggest thing is that there was a change, right? You send a pretty big message here. But there has been a tangible difference, and I didn't expect that. And so it's exceeded my expectations, and so I think that's potentially where you see me as a pretty like measured, try-to-be-reasonable guy allowing myself to get excited because it's exceeded what I expected. And not that I was being cowardly and not thinking that Joe Brady could just pull all the right levers, but I was careful to, to not let myself get to that point because, Hey, it's a tough assignment, short week. You got great defenses. The offense has been sloppy. Like how do you, how do you really have a tangible impact on the operation? Well, it's happened. And so that's what, that's where that excitement comes from. I like what's going on here. I really, really do. As you can tell. Mark says, in your opinion, what was the issue with Ken Dorsey's offense that uh, tweaks by Brady have been able to unlock a greater potential so quickly? Comments have been made by Dan Orlovsky and defensive players. The Bills offense had been one of the easiest teams to game plan for. Do you believe this to be true under Ken Dorsey? In addition, one play that I'm glad to see go away in the Brady era is the sprint draw. Can you explain the sprint draw and what Dorsey was seeing from the defense that he believed his play would be successful? It seemed to rarely result in positive yards. Are there any times, any are there any teams that use this play regularly with success? All right, so two parts here. I want to the the big difference for me and Joe Brady and Ken Dorsey outside of some of the stuff I just talked about is Ken Dorsey uh, had an offense that was designed to give answers to beat coverage. Right, so you would execute a play and. All of the answers were built in, but in order for those answers to be correct, everybody had to be on the same page. And so you had a lot of thinking and processing going on. And I'm not saying some of that's not true with Joe Brady, but I think Ken Dorsey tried to build this, build this offense that if they showed quarters or they showed cover three or they showed cover one, man, whatever it would be. Okay. This is what we do. If this, then that, if this, then that. Okay, that sounds good, but it just is too reliant on everybody doing the right thing at the right time and seeing it the same way. Not necessarily a bad thing. There's a lot of good offenses that do that. And yeah, is that a little bit of a knock on the players? Yeah, sure is. But I think that led to some disjointed looks and disjointed moments. I think Joe Brady goes and runs what he wants to run. I think he's aware of the defense and what they want to do, but he's more willing to dictate terms based on the concepts and principles that he wants to deploy. And that's what I've really appreciated. I think it's been the biggest difference. Like, hey, we're going to do what we want to do and dictate terms versus we're going to respond to what you're showing us and trust that we're going to be mentally sharp enough to always be correct in the answers and going to the answers that are provided within the offense. That's why whenever I talked about Ken Dorsey's offense and a lot in the all 22 reviews I say 
there's answers there. Like, I'm not watching this tape and saying that, hey, there's nowhere to go with the football or there's not a good idea here. The problem is the the how you get to everybody being on on the same page is difficult all the time, which is kind of what it was relied on. Joe Brady has really made enough tweaks here to allow them to dictate more. And uh, it's it's the spacing. The options are just better. As for the sprint draw part of this, sprint draw is going to be in any playbook in, in, for every NFL team, and it's a play that you should run from time to time. Uh, it's a good opportunity to catch defenses being aggressive, and um, if you can beat that first wave, you're, you're going to have a big explosive run. Now, the problem is when you don't beat that first wave, it's a tackle for a loss. And so you, it's, it's often a look, and, and Josh Allen checks into it a lot. I think that's where some of this criticism is misplaced. Josh Allen will check into sprint draw. And I think most of the times that people have been frustrated, he's checked into it because you feel like they're going to be aggressive coming up the field. You run sprint draw, you break that first wave, you're probably going to have an explosive run. Every team runs it. And be careful where you're directing criticism because Josh Allen has often audibled into that and it's not been successful. So it's a staple in any offense, long and late downs where you don't feel like you have a passing game answer. Um, it's not a bad play. It's not It's not a bad play, but unfortunately, it's one of those plays where if it doesn't work, it just looks like you're a crap offense. It's just like screen plays. Screen plays, when they work, oh my God, everybody loves it. Seems like the easiest thing in the world to do. When they don't work and the quarterback just grounds the ball, it just looks like crap, right? You either have it or you don't, and that's the reality in sprint draw uh, or QB draw or screen plays. It, that's just how it goes. But yeah, it's... And, and the Bills have been successful with it this year. It's not like this garbage play that shouldn't exist. It's just a, a play that, if it doesn't work, it just looks really bad, right? It's kind of kind of the thoughts there. Dan says, obviously, it's been a frustrating year, but I think a lot of people are biased in their opinions by the final results of a couple of games. For example, do you think we would be having different discussions and analysis if two plays were different, 12 men on the field and successful 59-yard field goal had a different outcome. But those plays really had nothing to do with how they played in those games. But if you change them, they would be 8-4 and four in the bye week. I realize you can't play the what-if game too much, but I do think those two plays have had a huge impact on everyone's analysis. Because of this, I'm more optimistic about their chances going forward. I'd feel worse if they, if it looked like they couldn't compete. Do you agree? I agree with that to an extent, but those finishes are one story, right? Okay, the guy doesn't make a 59-yard field goal in the rain. The Bills win. You don't have 12 men on the field. The Bills win, and you're 8-4. and four. Well, there's always the other side of the coin. What about the finishes against the Giants and Bucks that did go the Bills' way? Where the, there are some questionable things there. Are the Bills capable of being 8-4 and four or better? Absolutely. But the Bills are 6-6, six and six, and I think they deserve to be 6-6. Six and six. It's not just, okay, you flip these two plays, it goes your way, and it's better. Well, what about the times that it did go your way when it couldn't, where you wound up getting away with it? I think you have to factor that in. And so I think the Bills are rightfully 6-6. Six and six. Capable of more? Absolutely. But rightfully 6-6. Six and six. All right, folks, plenty of more to get to here today. Stick with me. But look, you shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event Game time is here, and it's the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. They've got killer deals on last-minute tickets, all in prices. They give you a view from your seat and the best price guarantee. I mean, simply put, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. The app is awesome. They have flash deals. I love logging in and just seeing what's available. Some great offers for you. And I also love that they send the tickets right to your phone. So you don't have to dig through emails to find the tickets. They go right to your phone so snag the tickets without the stress with game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on nfl for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem code locked on nfl for 20 dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed all right the next one here comes from bub who says although the loss was very painful on sunday this is the way a Josh, Josh Allen-led football team should be losing instead of games like the Jets, Jaguars, and Broncos. I don't disagree with that. Um, 
you know, I, I would like to think that with Josh Allen, you don't lose a lot of football games. And, and really, that is true. You do, with, like in the grand scheme of things, the Bills with Josh Allen have been very, very successful. They don't lose very often. And when they lose, it tends to be pretty close. I mean, when was the last time the Bills lost a game by more than like a touchdown? It don't really it doesn't happen. I know. OK, you're going to say the Bengals in the playoffs, but like regular season, you know, this year, all the talking points, well, they've lost six games, but none have been more than a six point loss or something like that. And last year they lost three games by a combined eight points. Right. I totally get that. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little tired of Josh Allen walking off the field with uh, with with the lead and then the defense giving it back. That that's what's annoying. Um, but yeah, to your point. Yeah, you should you should lose. <laughs> you'd, you'd hate to ever lose like you lost against Philly. But that is a lot better than like you mentioned, kind of the you know, the slot the Bron- Broncos and Jack and Jets game. Those are games where the Bills turned it over four times in each of those games. Jacksonville, like I thought Josh Allen played so good against Jacksonville. I think his supporting cast let him down. And then of course, I think they fudged that entire trip. Chris says, you've already shared uh, with me some of your thoughts on what the Bills should do in the offseason in terms of maybe letting some of the older vets go. But I'm really curious, what do you think the Bills should do with Epinesa? Is he someone you're really pushing to bring back hard? Is he someone you would like to have back, but the price contract needs to be right? Is he someone you think they should move on from, draft a replacement, and maybe try to get a future compensatory pick for him? I'm curious what you think you should do. I uh, appreciate this question from Chris, and I, I Chris is part of our subtext community. I really enjoy chatting with Chris. He has a lot of um, – Chris thinks a lot about practice squad. He thinks a lot of big picture, so him and I go back and forth and have some good conversations. Would encourage you to join the Lockdown Bills subtext community. Um, I've talked about in the past, one-on-one text conversations with me. I give you my live reactions uh, during games, my first reaction to all major Bills news, but we also have a Discord community that comes with it, and – you know, there's hundreds of Bills fans in there. We talk Bills, Sabres, life, fitness, all kinds of cool stuff. I give you my film clips in there. So I watch the film, talk through plays, and people have really enjoyed that. So check out the Lockdown Bills subtext community. There's a link to join in today's show notes. But also, one thing that's uh, been a disappointment with subtext is that it hasn't been available to our international audience. And I'm very, very happy to say that I have a way for you guys to be in our Discord community. Um, and not have the subtext piece of it. So if you are uh, an international listener and you'd like to be part of our Discord, send me an email, joemarino65 at gmail.com, and I have a way for you to get into our Discord. Uh, And if anybody would like to just join the Discord and don't want the subtext, send me an email, joemarino65 at gmail.com, and uh, I'll get you you hooked up there. Um, Was able to set it up in a way that, it's fair to our subtext subscribers as well to allow you in there. So send me an email. We'll, uh, we'll get you, we'll get you in there. Uh, but to answer the question from Chris, um, I would agree, dude, like AJ FNS is one of the hardest expiring contracts for me to, uh, settle in exactly where I, what I want the bills to do here. Um, I think I'd lean a lot more towards, I'd like him back if the numbers make sense. And I think the numbers could be in a lot of places. To me, I think the fair value for an AJ Epinesa is around five, six million dollars a season. And I think some comparable players in recent contracts that make sense to me, Anthony Nelson with the Buccaneers, Dorrance Armstrong with the Cowboys, even Dietrich Wise with the New England Patriots, similar amount of production, similar career trajectories, similar skill sets in a way. And that makes sense to me. And I would say one thing that's different about AJ and the three players I just mentioned, maybe not so much Nelson, is Wise and Armstrong play a lot more snaps than Epinesa does. And so I'm thinking five, six million dollars a year, two years, 10 to 12 million. That's what I think makes sense for an AJ Epinesa. Now, if there's some team out there and there's always this possibility, right? We saw this with Shaq Lawson and Jordan Phillips. They both signed like three year, $30 million deals to go to, was it Miami and Arizona respectively? If that's out there for them, they should take it. Like, AJ, you love the growth. Go take that deal. And so I think AJ Epinesa will probably want to take a moment to explore. I think he should have an an assurance that says, hey, look, here's a standing offer for you. Two years, $11 million. We'd love to have you back. But if you feel like you want to test the waters and see what's out there for you, you go do it. 
you don't find what you're looking for, we have this waiting for you. I think that's probably the the approach that I would have there. Um, but one thing, just generally speaking with, with the offseason, and I've hinted at this, and I haven't gotten super specific, but I'm not going to be afraid of resets. Like, I think the Bills need to get younger and cheaper in some spots. And so I'm I'm not going to stress over a lot of things. I'm not going to stress over Micah Hyde. I, I think the Bills should really think about releasing Jordan Poyer and really, th- of course, release Deontay Hardy. And not like Jordan Phillips, not you're not coming back. Um, yeah, I, I think there's some areas where you should really reset and and not not panic. Like I love Daquan Jones, I love him, I really do, but I'm not going to stress over it. I'm not going to stress over a north of 30 year old nose tackle uh, coming off of a pec injury. Like I'm just not going to. I, I feel like the Bills need to get younger and cheaper, and so I'm pretty much going to support. That even if it means some resets, even if it means, you know, some of the some of the uh, usual cast of characters moving on. That's kind of my offseason approach. And I, like you look at the Chiefs, they've reset their entire defense. They've reset their offensive tackle position. They've reset the receiver core. I'm not sure that's worked, but you can't be afraid to re- reset if you want to have staying power uh, at the top of this uh, this conference. And right now you're regressing. So, yeah, get younger and cheaper. Uh, Justin says, I know it's too early to be looking at this, but given how this season has gone, what would you say have been some of the biggest holes roster-wise and where you would expect Bean to be looking to improve the roster given cap constraints? Three things come to mind for me, Justin. I think wide receiver two. I think you don't give Gabe Davis any money. Uh, You let him walk, and you use a first-round pick or second-round pick on a much more complete player, a guy that can separate, a guy that can win after the catch, a guy that has legit vertical speed. Give yourself a nice complimentary piece to Stefan Diggs and Dalton Kincaid and Khalil Shakir. Like, imagine a hit, a wide receiver hit in the first two rounds, plus Diggs, plus Kincaid, plus Shakir, plus James Cook. Like, let's go. <laughs> let's go with that. I'm, I, that's what I want. I want a more complete wide receiver, too. Uh, I think the Pills are missing a dude on the D line. I think they got some good players. Love Greg Rousseau, love Leonard Floyd. Love Ed Oliver. Love some nice role players in an AJ Epinesa. But what you need Von Miller to be, you don't have that, right? And you've got a lot tied into having that, and you don't. I think that's missing in a big way. Who's that guy? Who's that closer? Who's that guy when you got to have it late in games? It's going to win, and protection schemes are scared of him. Again, the Bills have some good players. They don't have a dude. They don't have an elite guy on that D-line that can just take over football games. And then I think you need more playmaking at safety. I do. Um, I think, again, I, I talked about this last week. I'm careful to say that Poyer and Hyde are cooked and that they're complete slugs out there, but the impact and the playmaking, not what it's been. And I think that's missing from this defense right now. So wide receiver, two, a, a legit, complete skill set there. You know, a dude on this D-line, and then an, a more of an impact making plays at safety. And, you know, obviously love to have Milano. <laughs> that would be nice. Um, but you know, I, I would probably layer in, um, like if I were to talk about the safety, I might say more playmaking in the spine of the defense. You know, like I love what they're getting from Terrell Bernard, and I would love what they were getting from Matt Milano if he was available. But not having Matt Milano, and Dodson's done fine in his downhill role, but not having Milano combined with not having the usual impact from Poyer and Hyde, I think that kind of highlights that component of the defense for me. All right, folks, that's for it for Herd Mentality. Great questions. Always appreciate everyone's participation. I thought this went really well. Uh, very excited about the rest of the week here. A lot of content. So we have uh, conversations coming up with Greg Tomset. That's going to come out on Monday afternoon. Bruce Nolan, that's going to come out on Tuesday afternoon. Nate Geary, that's going to come out on Wednesday. And then we're going to have crossover Thursday with the Chiefs guys, full Chiefs primer. And then, of course, my final thoughts, injuries, and predictions. So six more episodes this week. So we're going to get out of the bye week. We're going to get into Chiefs week with plenty of conversation. So don't miss anything. Make sure that you're subscribed. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills. And I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.